Hello, welcome to Until Ministries. Thank you for joining us. Well, we're approaching that very sacred, special time of the year when we celebrate the glorious resurrection of the Lord Jesus after his horrible crucifixion. And what we've been doing these past few weeks, if you've been with us, is we've been studying the seven words from the cross. These are the utterances that Jesus cried from the cross during his crucifixion. And we've been discovering some very, very poignant uh, and powerful applications to our modern day lives. So far, we've looked at the first, second, and third words from the cross, and they were the word of sympathy, the word of salvation, and the word of support, which we did last week, and that was about uh, Mary at the foot of the cross. And today, we're going to meditate on the word of separation. And this word, uh, this utterance came when Jesus suffered the horrible spiritual agony of being separated from the Father and the Holy Spirit as he bore our sins on the cross. And as we've been doing in this series, I'll give you a little overview at first, and then we'll get into the meat of the message. And there will be some repetition that's by design to glorify the Lord and the truths that I may repeat. But um, we're going to look at three things when we get into the body of it. We're going to look at the substitution, the separation, and the salvation. The substitution, the separation, and the salvation. First of all, we want to look at this stressful utterance of separation. And uh, we read it from both Mark uh, and Matthew. Matthew and Mark are the only two gospel writers that record this saying. And in each case, that's the only saying that they record. And um, so it's very, very important. And you'll see how important this utterance is. They all are, but this one is something we really want to concentrate. So Jesus is hanging on the cross and he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabbathani. And that means in a combination of Hebrew and Aramaic that Matthew and Mark uh, both used, it means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And this was prophesied in Psalm 22, 1, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. And that's how Psalm 22 starts. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So I want us to understand that at this point in time, Jesus is bearing all the sins of the world on himself, even though he himself is totally innocent. Jesus never sinned in thought or word or deed, not once. Never did he have a sinful thought or a sinful word or a sinful deed. He was totally perfect. He was totally innocent. Yet at this point in time, he's bearing all our sin, the sin of the whole world, on himself. And so God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, the other members of the Sacred Trinity, they had to turn their backs, as it were, on the sin that Jesus was bearing because God cannot look upon sin. And so Jesus was himself innocent, but he took my sin and your sin upon himself. And that separation from the Father and the Spirit was really the worst part of the ordeal for Jesus. Did you know that? The physical agony was horrible. The beating, the crucifixion, the torturing, that was horrible. Uh, the, the betrayal by his friends, the abandonment by his disciples, the injustice of the whole thing, those were so painful for Jesus. But this was the worst of all, to be separated from the rest of the Godhead, from the Father and from the Holy Spirit. Never before and never since was the Trinity ever separated. It was just at that point in time when Jesus was bearing our sin. And, you know, uh, Jesus didn't ask this question, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't ask that question in order to get an answer. He knew the answer. He asked the question so that you and I could be taught what sin-bearing really means. 
so that you and I could see how serious sin is and what it meant to the Son of God and to the Father and to the Spirit. And so Jesus wanted to give us a window to look into what was going on between Father and Son and Holy Spirit and how that horrible agony was caused by our sin. And so it's an example to you and to me to take our sin seriously uh, because God can't look on our sin either. Did you know that? So we got to get rid of it. And there's only one way to get rid of it, and that's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So we need to take our sin seriously, and we need to let Jesus wash it away with his blood. So now let's get into the meat of our message. We're going to look again at the substitution, the separation, and the salvation. First of all, the substitution. And for this, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter 2.24, Isaiah 53, 4-12, and 2 Corinthians 5.21. And I'm going to read all those because they have such glorious truth in them. So as we look at the substitution, we're seeing that Jesus is hanging on the cross and he was the sin bearer. He was bearing all our sin. He was taking the place of the sinner, including you and me. And here he is burdened by this immense weight of sin on his perfect sinless shoulders. He took the rap for us in modern language. Jesus took the rap for us. He took the punishment that we deserved. Every human being, including you and including me, are sinners. Romans 3.23 says, For all, all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I'm going to read for you 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, and then again Isaiah 53. We won't read all 12 verses, but some verses from Isaiah 53 and from 2 Corinthians 5, 21, so that you can see how Jesus took our sin upon him and he became the sin bearer, okay? So let's look first of all at 1 Peter 2, 24. It says, speaking of Jesus, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. So Peter tells us that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross. And then in the book of Isaiah, an Old Testament book written hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, here's what Isaiah prophesied. He said, Surely our griefs, he himself, speaking of Jesus, he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastening for our well-being fell on him, and by his scourgings we are healed healed. You see that? He took our sins upon himself. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He carried our sorrow and our grief and our sin. And then 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. This is a verse I encourage you to memorize, by the way. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, he made, speaking of God, he made him, speaking of Jesus, he made him who knew no sin. Remember I told you Jesus never sinned. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Sinless Jesus was made to be sin on our behalf so that we could be made righteous. What a great, great exchange that is. So 
Jesus is on the cross and he's bearing all the sin of the whole world, past, present, and future, all on his sinless shoulders. And remember, this is an important point. Remember, Jesus hates sin. Jesus is God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God hates sin. And sin is repugnant to them. And sin was repugnant to Jesus. And yet, he who is perfect had to become sin on our behalf. Can you imagine taking on something that was repugnant to you? He did it out of love for us. It's amazing. So that's about his position as we look at the substitution. Now let's look at the per perpetrators. Who are the perpetrators? Well, whose sin was Jesus bearing? Who was he substituting for? Who was he taking the rap for? Who was responsible for the crucifixion? Was it the Romans? Was it the Jews? No. It was Bill Wilson. It was Bill Wilson and whoever you are. Because of our sin, Jesus had to die. It's because of our sin that Jesus had to die. All of us, you, I, all sinners, all human beings, put him there because of our sin. And he himself was sinless. Now, here's a little phrase that I like. It's a chorus, but uh, one of my gifts from the Lord is not to sing. So I can't sing this for you, but I'll tell you what the key phrase is, and you can, I'll repeat it, and you can try to remember it. So when you're, the little chorus says, I owed a debt I could not pay, and he, speaking of Jesus, paid a debt he did not owe. That's what it comes down to. I owed a debt that I could not pay. And Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe because he was sinless. Isn't that something? And why would Jesus make this, soup, this substitution? What was the purpose of the substitution? It was so you and I could be forgiven. So we could be redeemed. So our sin could be washed away. So that we could have salvation and eternal life. It was for the removal of our sin and for the gift of eternal life. That's why Jesus substituted himself for us. That's why he paid a debt that he did not owe. Because you and I owed a debt that we couldn't pay. You and I can't get rid of our sin. Did you know that? There's no way that we can get rid of our sin because sin can only be washed away by the blood, as I, re I read to you earlier. And so uh, Jesus shed blood is the only way that we can get rid of our sin. We need to keep that in mind. So we've looked at the stressful word of separation as sort of an overview. We've looked at the substitution. Now we want to look at the separation itself. The separation itself, and here we're going to look at Psalm 22.1. Remember I told you that it's the first verse of Psalm 22. Psalm 22.1, Matthew 27.46, which we've read, Mark 15.34, which is the parallel passage, and then Galatians 3.13. These are the verses that we're going to look at. So again, I'm going to read these verses, the powerful word of God. And um, we'll, we're going to read now, we've read the words of Jesus, but I'm going to put them in the context and we'll be reading from Matthew's gospel. Um, Mark's gospel is parallel here. And here's what it says. It says, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbathani, that is my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Now, in the Hebrew timetable, the ninth hour is about three o'clock in the afternoon. And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. But the rest of them said, 
let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And then it says, And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. And so we see here that Jesus is crying out that word of separation. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we're going to now break that down and go into it in a little more depth. And we're first of all, we're going to look at the cause of the separation. Now remember, we're talking about Jesus suffering because he separated from God the Father and he separated from God the Holy Spirit because he's bearing our sin and the Godhead cannot look upon the sin. So because of all the stuff all the sin of the world being put on the sinless one, who is Jesus, the Father and the Spirit could not look upon sin and they had to turn away as Jesus bore the curse of sin and he identified himself with the sin of the world. Watch what's happening here. So Jesus knew he was sinless. He knew he had never sinned. But now he has to not only bear the sin, but he has to identify with the sin of the world and this was a horrible thing because I told you sin was repugnant to him. And Galatians 3.13 says that Jesus actually became a curse on our behalf so that we could be blessed. He was cursed because the Bible says cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's becoming a curse. Why? For us. Not for himself, because he was perfect. So during the three hours of darkness, the sixth hour, which is noon in the Hebrew calendar, to, or to, to timetable, I should say, the sixth hour to the ninth hour, that is noon to 3 p.m., the, the Holy Father and the Holy Spirit could not look on the Son with favor for the first and only time in all of history eternity past the present time and eternity future never again would they not be able to look on the son of God with favor remember when Jesus was baptized and um, here's a beautiful picture of the trinity when Jesus was baptized Jesus is God the son he's down in the water he's being baptized by immersion by um, John the Baptist. And while the God the Son is in the water, God the Father cries out of heaven and there's thunderous voice out of heaven says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He was totally pleased with his Son. And at the same time, God the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove and came down and lit upon Jesus. So there you see God the Son is in the water. God the Father is crying out from heaven and God the Holy Spirit is coming in the form of a dove to alight on Jesus. So you see the, the Holy Spirit again and you see that God uh, the Father and the Spirit were so pleased with Jesus the Son. But now, for the first and only time in history, they can't look on him with favor. Why? Because he's got my sin and your sin on his shoulders. And they can't look on that sin. And this was the most horrible part of this awful, awful time for Jesus. It was worse than the brutal physical suffering. It was worse than the painful emotional suffering. It was worse than the betrayal. It was worse than the mental anguish. To be separated from the Father and the Spirit was just incredibly, incredibly, unfathomably brutal and difficult and agonizing. He had never been separated from the Father. He had never before been separated from the Spirit, and he never would again. And so Jesus was as... Jesus in his humanity was in unfathomable despair and loneliness. What a sad, sad story. Why? 
Because he loved us. He loved us and he knew there was no other way for us to deal with our sin. And that's why it's so important if you're listening or watching today uh, as I give this message, um, if you think you can get your way to heaven and get your way to forgiveness some other way, out of love and concern and compassion for you, I'm here to tell you, you cannot. The only way you can get rid of your sin and be forgiven and have eternal life and have a real relationship with Jesus is to take him as your blood sacrifice, take him into your heart as your Lord and Savior. There's no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so Jesus was in this despair as he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, again, when Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was asking a question, but he wasn't asking a question because he didn't know the answer. He wasn't asking a question because he wanted to hear the answer. He knew the answer, but listen to this now. This is very, very important. Jesus asked that question because he wanted to give you and he wanted to give me insight as to what he was going through on our behalf. The question is really a window. Look at this question as a window into the depth of Jesus' broken heart and pain so that we could make a feeble attempt of feeling it, of feeling what he was going through on our behalf a feeling what he was going through for us so that we could be uh, forgiven, so that our sins could be washed away, so that we could be in heaven. That's why Jesus asked the question, not to get the answer. He knew the answer, but rather to give us a window to see what was going on with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the agony that they suffered for us. He wanted us to be able to try to feel it. Now remember, God the Father and God the Spirit, as they had to turn their backs on God the Son because he was bearing sin, which was repugnant to all of them, that doesn't mean that the Father didn't suffer terribly. He suffered terribly having to turn away from his Son. He suffered terribly because he had to pour out his judgment and his wrath on his own Son. Jesus took our place. He took the wrath for us. So the punishment and the wrath and the judgment that you and I deserved, Jesus took in our place. Isn't that incredible? We need to praise him and thank him. I thank him every day, Lord. Thank you for taking my place because I deserve that judgment. I deserve that wrath. I deserve that punishment, but Jesus took it for me. And of course, the Holy Spirit suffered as well because the Holy Spirit's function is to glorify Jesus. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, to glorify Jesus and to bring glory and attention to him. So this question shows how deeply and how profoundly our sin, my sin and your sin, affected all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can't even fathom it. We can't even fathom it. Please let that grip your heart. Please look into that window that God made possible by Jesus' words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We're going to wrap up now with the salvation. And this is really the answer to the question. Uh, the reason that the Father and Spirit were were willing to forsake Jesus. The, will, the reason Jesus was a willing and able and, and loving and was willing to do it is for the same reason. It was so that we could be right with God, so we could have access with God. So we're going to look at Matthew 27, 51, Mark 15, 38, Hebrews 9, 11, and 12, 1 Peter 3, 18, and then we'll look at uh, John 3.16, which I know most of you know already. But anyway, we, we've read the verses from Matthew and Mark. And uh, Matthew and Mark 
both tell us that afterwards, just moments afterwards, the temple, uh, the curtain in the temple was split in two from top to bottom. And that was all about access. For the first time, God answered this question because for the first time, man could go into the very presence of God. Man couldn't do that before because he's sinful. Now man, if we believe, we can go into the very presence of God. And so watch this now. Jesus suffered leaving God's presence, the Father's presence, so we could experience going into the Father's presence. And that's what the temple curtain being ripped, that, that was a, a symbol of being able to get into the Holy of Holies, in, like in the temple, to be in the very presence of God. And so by believing in his sacrifice on our behalf, we gain forgiveness we gain forgiveness of sin and eternal peace with God and everlasting life. And remember, the very heart of Jesus was right in the center of the cross. And that's where God's wrath and judgment meet his love and grace in the heart of Jesus. God didn't give up his justice or his righteousness. He had to punish the sin, so he punished his own son. And Jesus and the Father and the Spirit did this out of love for us. So in, his, in Jesus' heart, right on that center of the cross, that's where love and grace meet justice and righteousness and judgment. So we close with one more question, and that is, I'm asking you from the bottom of my heart, because this is why I do this ministry, have you entered into the very presence of God? Have you believed in and received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you said, oh, Lord Jesus, I know you're the Son of God. I know you died on the cross and rose again for me. Please, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, forgive my sin, and be my Lord and my Master. Have you responded to that love that motivated the sacred trinity to take on us such a horrible agony due to separation caused by our sin? Oh, I hope you see it. Ask for forgiveness. Receive Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. Commit your life to him. Live for him. If you already know Jesus, live all out for him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God bless you.